a tea break. Uh, we're going to try and run this session as quickly as possible. Um, like Ikechuku said, I think it's fundamental that we know what our clients want. You know, we've been talking about what we will give to our clients. I think it's high time we hear from some of our clients and they tell us what they really want. The, the market is changing. Things are becoming more dynamic. People have been scared from what they've been hearing the last uh, day and a half about where is the law going? Where are we going in Nigeria? And um, to help us go through this session, I'd like to invite onto the stage here Kamal Shah. Kamal is the head of Stevenson Howard's Africa. Kamal, where are you? Can you please come up? Kamal is the head of Stevenson Howard's Africa and India practice. He specializes in complex cross border international arbitration, litigation, and fraud asset tracing in Africa and India. And that would be a lot of work if you're tracing things like that in Africa and India. You know? And given his extensive experience there, he's, um, I think, one of the best people to be speaking to this topic. Um, Kamal is currently the Vice President of the LCIA, African Users Council, and the Director of the Business Council for Africa. He's highly regarded. All the directories that we look at and that we participate in um, give him A rating. He is commended for being charming. I'm, I'm still waiting to see the charm, actually. And he's wonderful handling clients, you know. So welcome, Kamal. Can we please give Kamal a nice round of applause? Let's welcome him. And Kamal has been here since Sunday morning, so Kamal, I thank you. And Kamal is also a supporter of this conference. Kamal, thank you very much. The next person is somebody that I'm very partial to, extremely partial to. Um, Tino Adeawe, she's the general counsel and head of regulation at the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Um, she's responsible for regulating listed companies and daily members of the exchange. Tinu has practiced in Nigeria, she's practiced in New York, now she's a regulator of a sort, um, and I'd like to especially welcome you, uh, dear Tinu. And Tinu grew up in Ibadan like me, so for people that grew up in Ibadan, we have a, a special affinity. Tinu studied at Harvard, she got a first class in Nigerian law school, and she went to the LSC. So, um, You'll all understand why I have, I have a special affiliation towards her. Tinu, welcome. The next person I'll be calling up is somebody else who was, uh, you know, I have all these personal relationships, my principal's daughter. You know, if you went to that school that um, Ulumide was talking about yesterday, there's a certain kind of person that will always be your principal. Imoni Akbufure. Um, she has such a broad experience. Also a first-class mind and a first-class student. Um, she has an MBA. She's an engineer. She's worked with financing, the IFC, and the, and the World Bank. Um, she's more recently been a regional director for Africa for the CDC group. Um, she holds an MBA from INSEAD, an MSc in environmental engineering from Newcastle University, and a B engineering in civil engineering from Imperial College. So um, we have thoroughly first class minds here. Last but not the least is one of our major employers, you know, and it's somebody we all here can't afford to upset. But that's also another first class mind, a Harvard graduate. Um, they call him Alaji now. I don't call him Alaji, I call him Sadiq. Um, Alaji. Sadiq Abubakar Adamu, General Counsel, ExxonMobil, and their affiliated companies. One thing I can tell you is that the last three general counsel in Mobile have gone off to become much bigger things. So please stay in touch with Sadiq. You don't know where he's going to end up, you know. Um, but Sadiq, as a first class mind, he was called to the bar in 1987. He attended Oxford University and attended Harvard Business School. He joined Mobile straight from school when he graduated from Harvard and he joined and worked in the United States. Um, his experience is extensive and those of us who have worked with him know that this is a truly first class mind. Thank you. I think we will start immediately. We don't have a lead speaker, but I'm going to be asking all the panelists to speak for about five to seven minutes. 
and then we will have audience participation. But for me, what is key is this, you know, we've been here, we've been listening to the changing face of the legal practice, and part of the changing face of the legal practice is the changing needs and wants of clients. Um, there was a time when I first started practice, all you needed to be was to be a good lawyer. That's all you needed to be. I'm sure that has moved on. You know, everybody assumes we're all good lawyers. So what do our clients truly want in 2017? And what will our clients truly want going on into the future? What do we need to do to win our clients and to keep our clients? Um, I'll start with Imoni. What, you know, you are not a lawyer, you know, and, uh, but you've been using lawyers forever, you know, so really, what do we need to be looking at? Thank you very much, Aswe. Thank you for inviting me. I was a bit intimidated that I wasn't a lawyer, but then my sister is a lawyer, I have lawyer cousins, I have lawyer friends, so I claim the lawyership. Um, so I'm just going to talk about sort of two aspects initially from a personal perspective as, as a client and then from a project perspective with a lot of my uh, development finance institution experience. What do people want from lawyers? I think the basic thing is clear advice at a reasonable cost. Things like, it sounds very basic, legal position, right? When we ask you for advice, we want to know what's the legal position? What is the practical position? What are local norms? Right? So, you know, we can hear all about what the legal position is, but what happens locally? And then finally, what are the risks associated with the various options that we have? So if I take it, I'll take first the personal. That, that's actually quite quick. Um, so for me, um, you think of something, okay, I need to do a will. I come to a lawyer. Are you able to sit me down and go through the process and are you able to help me think about things? When we look at new things coming along, how many of us here have thought about what I call our social media assets? Can I just have a show of hands? Ah, see, I see, I bet that person's a millennial. Think about it. I have a Twitter account, I have a LinkedIn account. I don't do Facebook, but a lot of us do Facebook. When somebody is writing a will, have we thought as the lawyers of, well, what are you going to do with your social media assets when you pass on? I tell you that if the first lawyer who said that to me, I looked, I was like, wow, I hadn't thought about that. This is somebody who's thinking for the future. Mortgages, um, basic things. Are you able to give me good advice as I want to buy a house? Litigation, we all hope we're never going to be sued. But I have a very good friend who a neighbor has just sued her. Something very trivial. But luckily she knew exactly where to go. Again, outside of Nigeria, with my American Express card, I have a monthly premium that I pay and they have a list of lawyers that I can call up who will give me litigation services at a very reasonable cost. Is this something that we, as law firms in Nigeria, we started thinking about, either teaming up with the insurance companies, etc.? This is a market opportunity that is missing here in Nigeria. I worry that if I ever get sued in Nigeria, I'll start calling around to say, where do I go for a lawyer? Forming companies. Most uh, of our small businesses, SMEs, um, you know, individual companies are intimidated at the thought of who to go to to find a lawyer. If they could get good quality, clarity on where to go, clarity on processes, and again, I come back to at a reasonable price, this is something that would be very valued. So then let me go to sort of, I guess, the, the, a lot of my background outside of the personal, which is, is the transactions. So um, as Development finance institutions, um, financiers who are looking for legal services. We're looking for people who understand, first of all, you have to understand the client. Again, some of these things sound very basic, but do you understand me? If I'm a multilateral development bank, you know, that, that 
has, well, it's basically a supranational organization. So it's beyond national uh, boundaries. Does the law firm understand that? Do they understand that I have certain immunities and privileges which are very important to me? Can they work with that, within that framework and give me advice that's not going to compromise my immunities and privileges? Do they understand my business? I'm doing a lot in the private equity space. I have funds, I have general partners that I'm investing in. Do they understand this business? Infrastructure, oil and gas. There are some law firms that say we are really good at infrastructure. I will go to a law firm like that if I'm doing an infrastructure transaction. It's just basic. There are other law firms that market, and then when you get beyond there, you find that they don't have the expertise. Do they understand the financial sector? So what we tend to do as DFIs is we will pre-select law firms that we will work with based on the areas of expertise they have, but also more importantly based on the teams. And this is again feedback for law firms, especially the bigger ones who have very good names and reputations tend to think, oh, I have, um, I've won the job on the basis of my reputation. Nowadays as DFIs, we're looking beyond that. We want to know which team are you putting on? Which partner? Which senior associate? Below senior associate? I want to see their CV. I want to see what transactions they've done in my sector so that I understand that they know what they're doing. I'm not just going to hire based on your name. Um, the cost. So, Obviously, we're all watching costs, and I know some of the other clients are going to talk a bit more about this, but we're all watching costs. But nowadays, we're looking and saying, well, how can we be much more innovative in what the law firms are providing to us? If I'm in a project development phase, I don't know if this transaction is going to go ahead. As a law firm, are you going to come up with a cap? Are you going to offer me a success fee? If the transaction goes ahead, you get more money. If it doesn't, well, we share a little bit of the pain. Some law firms are being innovative and doing those kinds of things. Are you being reasonable in your costs? We've dropped people who we just find are being unreasonable. They're charging a premium. One of the positive things for uh, Nigerian law firms is that now a lot of the DFIs don't make the distinction between uh, local partner fees versus international partner fees. It's just the quality that I should get from a lawyer at the partner level is X, and those are the fees that are being charged, whether they're local or international. Same for uh, senior associates, etc. But what we're expecting is that when you're coming up with a cost, you are going to be reasonable. And if you come up with a cap, you will respect the cap. It's very annoying, and people have dropped firms who they just feel are being unre unreasonable about this. Um, some general advice that I would, I would give to law firms, um, managing expectations. So on the speed, things that we promise, we know what our courts are like. There's no point telling me something is going to take three months or six months when you know that you have absolutely no control over the court system. Nice to give a bit of, if all goes well, this is the range, and if it doesn't go well, well, you know. Um, to keep abreast of sector and regulatory developments. This is really critical. For financial institutions that are not based in Nigeria, who are coming and saying, we want advice, and then somebody else who's based in London calls us and says, that law firm who just told you that, um, you know, I'll give it, stamp duty has been abolished, um, you know, is a London-based law firm, whereas, you, whereas your Nigerian-based law firm didn't know that. It just really makes you doubt the veracity of the advice that you're, you're getting. Smaller law firms, be more proactive. A lot of the smaller law firms are intimidated about going beyond, um, you know, the, the borders or about marketing themselves to the international financial institutions. We find that quite often, it is better to get a partner or a senior associate from a smaller law firm than to get some junior lawyer from a really big name firm who doesn't have the time. And quite often, the big name firms can be overloaded and overstretched. So for the smaller ones,
good for you to market um, the Africa Finance Corporation. All you need to do is go on their website, send in your documents, register, and you're then on the roster. Same for the Africa Development Bank. So once you're on the roster and you keep yourself, you know, you, if you have an update, you send them the update, you're there and they think about you if opportunities come. I'll talk a little bit about culture. Um, as I was preparing for this, I talked with a lot of the council in, in quite a few DFIs and um, somebody said to me, hmm, one of the problems that we have is uh, responsiveness and that you call and the person will tell you I'm at a funeral or I'm in my village. And I used to live in Ghana. And you know that in Ghana, the funeral is the best place to network. You get the minister or the president or the vice president, they're there for three hours, they cannot move. So you have them captive. If I'm sitting in Accra and I call a lawyer and he says, I'm at a funeral, I understand that that's a marketing networking opportunity. But if I call from London and you tell me you're at a funeral, I just think, why are you at a funeral on a Friday? So sometimes on the culture side, we have to understand who we're talking to. I'm not in the office. I have a colleague who will respond to you. That is enough. The person doesn't need to know you're sit sitting in your village or you're at a funeral or something. It sounds basic again. Um, and then in terms of development and capacity building, there are opportunities for secondments um, with various companies. I know Kamal's going to talk a, a little bit more about this. But these are things that as you build relationships with the international financial institutions to think about, um, can I second somebody who gets to know this organization so that I can try and um, source some work? I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Imani. Clear advice, reasonable cost risks, managing expectations, culture. Don't say you're in the village on Thursday, you know, and things like that. Anyway. Um, that culture thing, I think we'll come back to it. I find it really interesting. Kamal, internationally, you are in one of the big law firms. You know, from your own perspective, um, what do you think clients now want, you know? And then looking in from outside, what do you think we here should be focusing on in our relationship with our clients? Thank you. Um, as we know, clients have numerous needs and wants, like all of us, but they're different. Different clients have different needs, different wants. Some might want the cheapest advice, some might want the best branded law firm, some might want the biggest law firm, or they want a very, very niche specialism. So it, it's quite different from law firm um, uh, and the perspective of clients. There are some common areas which, which I have gathered in my experience, so I'm going to share some of the themes uh, with you. The first is, is listening very hard, being responsive and communication. It's an essential skill which few lawyers seem to have, is to listen very hard, pick up the subliminal you know, signals that you're getting from your clients. What do they like? What do they dislike? Do they like looking at advice by email or in some cases by WhatsApp? And so on. You know, we have very busy clients these days who are always on the move, so some may prefer that listen out for internal politics. You might get some hints that there are issues between the general counsel and the board. Make their life easier by tweaking your advice uh, accordingly. Uh, and all of this comes from listening very hard and very carefully. Uh, the other factor is a responsiveness. Prompt responses are important. Respond to say you receive the email. You don't have to give substantive advice there and then, but at least clients feel that you've, you've acknowledged their email and they don't worry over the weekend whether you've got the email and when they're going to get the advice. It's a small thing, but actually it means a lot to a busy uh, client. Getting the advice right is, is important, is, is more important than getting it out uh, in 24 hours. And, and this is something clients always tell us is, look, don't rush unless we tell you it's urgent. Uh, take a bit of time, but get it right. Uh, and, and from the law firm point of view, I often come across lawyers who want to just rush it out and they think clients will instruct them again and again because they've got it out in 12 hours or 24 hours. It's, it's not always the case. Check with your clients. Communication is, is obviously very key. Keep them up to date regularly. Uh, talk straight with them. They don't like long legal flowery language. It's not really what you're paid for. Uh, and I always tell my associates to, to keep the KISS approach in, in mind. It's keep it very short and simple. You're not paid to do long legal essays. You're, you're paid to find 
solutions to commercial problems which make your client's life easier, both internally and externally. Delivering bad messages uh, immediately uh, and, and raising problems immediately, not, not, not without any solutions, but with solutions and some thoughts. Uh, clients like that because if you're presented with a problem, the first thing you think, well, what is the solution? So, you know, make their life easier in that respect. And that often differentiates the good lawyers from the really exceptional ones, uh, certainly in my experience. Mode of communication. Uh, we're all on the move these days. Uh, clients, uh, talk to your clients. What do they like? Do they want you to communicate by WhatsApp, by email, by fax? Talk to them. I often get instructions, the most serious instructions by WhatsApp uh, from clients on the move. And that's fine as long as you back it up with a formal communication at some point later. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and, and probably the most important under this heading is, is feedback. Ask for feedback. Clients love being asked for feedback. How are you doing? How are your associates doing? How is your PA doing? Ask them at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, and even when you don't have a job for them. It, it, we all like being asked uh, at a hotel when we check in, how was your, your experience? So why not ask your, your clients that? Most people will be happy. The second theme is uh, staffing and choosing the right team. Um, uh, get the right team with the right experience. People who know the industry, they have a bit of commercial understanding, who keep up with the papers and, and what's happening rather than putting in a, putting in a rookie who, who doesn't really know about the industry. That's very important. Uh, and if you don't have the experience, have the courage to tell a client, I'm sorry, we can't do this job for you, but I know someone who, who can. Uh, and we've had situations where, where we've had to do that for certain very niche areas, and clients appreciate it. They will hopefully remember you next time and come back to you because they, they see that you've taken a very mature approach rather than using them as guinea pigs. In terms of staffing, uh, I find partner-led teams are important, but not always. Clients just want someone who they can trust, they can reach, whether it's a senior associate or a partner or even a junior associate. If they are exceptional, it doesn't really matter, provided there is someone for the clients to pick up the phone and talk through a problem. Uh, teaming, uh, we often get asked uh, how big are our teams. Uh, I've generally found that smaller, leaner teams with the right experience of seniority and experience uh, makes a big difference. It's better to have that than huge teams of people who, who don't really know what they're doing or they don't have the experience or a natural leader in the, in the team. Keeps costs down, makes it more efficient and, and helps to speed up the uh, uh, advice as well. Uh, team members from similar cultures, uh, countries, you may have uh, some in yours where you feel, well, should I put this associate with this client? They may be from the same tribe, culture, country. Uh, check with clients. It, it sometimes works amazingly well and, and sometimes it doesn't. Clients are very sensitive to, to these sorts of things, so, so check with them. Um, the last point under this is, is pitching. When you're pitching to a client physically, we all get asked to do a beauty parade. Make sure they have the opportunity to meet your associates. They like to, to, to shake their hand, they like to get to know them and see what, what they're, they're about, what, they're, what are their personalities, can they trust them? Uh, and uh, often you'd be surprised that you win pitches because your competitor shielded the associates rather than wheeling them out to, to meet the clients and let them have a rapport. Helps the client, helps you, helps the associates as well in terms of progression. The third area is costs, uh, and again, Imoni touched on this. Uh, there's a huge downward pressure on, on fees, we all know that. It's not just here, it's, it's every single place uh, on the planet now. And it's not really going to change very, very fast. Uh, in tough times, if you, if you roll with your clients on that, work with them, generally in the good times, they will come back and you will make up. There are some deals where you can charge premium rates and on others you have to take a haircut. But it evens out when, when you do have a good relationship uh, with, your, with your clients. Um, they want certainty, of course they do, we all do, um, uh, and there is a, generally a trend of hourly rates uh, going down, going out of the window. There are a lot more creative fee structures that, that we're seeing, and I'm sure you are as well. Uh, there are conditional fee arrangements, there are discounted rates, uh, blended rates where you have different grades of associates all on one rate, 
for example, keeps costs down. Clients know that they're paying one rate rather than three or four different rates. There are fixed fees, there are capped rates, uh, and in some cases uh, for IPOs there are uh, success fees and abort fees which can work quite well when you're sharing the risk with a client who's going to an uh, IPO. Um, cost management <coughs> is very important. Uh, having lean teams to avoid duplication and to retain the core knowledge within a small group of people rather than spread across five or ten people uh, is, is very important. And keeping clients regularly informed. Ask them what they want. Do they want weekly updates, monthly updates? In what form? Do they want a text message or a, a long narrative? Work with them to make their life easier. And uh, when you reach a point, which I'm sure every single lawyer in this room has reached, you gave a budget of X, you've exceeded it by 20%, 100%, 200%. Break the news in a mature way, come up with a proposal, take a bit of the pain, and ask them to take a bit of the pain. It, generally, having a proper mature discussion helps. They, after all, have to refer up to the board, perhaps, or have budgetary constraints. So. Uh, rather than demanding a, a fee, I always find working with, with your clients maintains a relationship and, and holds you in a better state uh, for, for a later uh, mandate. Uh, next point is coordination of regional and overseas lawyers. We're all working on cross-border deals and cross-border disputes. It's very important to, to demonstrate that you can project manage for a client. They might ask, uh, a local firm to project manage an international law firm, we've had that, or they might ask, ask us to manage three or four law firms uh, on, on the ground in, in Africa or elsewhere. Uh, clients don't like doing it themselves generally because of the headaches of managing three, four, five different law firms, different time zones and so on. So if you can demonstrate that you have experience, it, it is valuable. Uh, but that doesn't mean you go off and, and, and Google random names and say, yes, we know X, Y, and Z firm. You, demonstrating you've worked with them before, you've had secondments, perhaps you've done some training to show that you, you really know each other very well. Uh, and, and, and the best story I can share on that is we, there's a firm in Mauritius we work with very well. The senior partner there, fantastic lawyer, but he disappears for three or four days sometimes uh, on his boat uh, to go away and do some work. He, that's how he does his uh, core work. And if you don't have his mobile number, you're going to wonder and, and pull your hair out thinking he's ignoring you. Actually, he's not. So, so having that knowledge obviously makes a big uh, difference. Um, use of technology is the next one. Uh, it's so advanced nowadays and there are new innovations coming out every single day. It's still early days for some of it, uh, but that's the future. A lot of it's going to be artificial intelligence. A lot of our finance and corporate deals and online data rooms are going to be on, on the web uh, so that anywhere in the world can access it. Trying to incorporate some of that into your practices does help, can keep costs down, and means that you speed up advice with people all over uh, the world. Um, the last heading I, I wanted to share is some value adds. We, we're all asked to give more advice, to give more freebies, to give more value adds uh, for less money. And it's all about relationship building. And some of the things we have found work uh, are as follows. Firstly, having legal helplines where you agree with a client that they can call you for up to two hours or three hours or more of free legal advice to use you as a sounding board and to get some immediate gut feel from you works pretty well. Uh, and I've found that in due course, that matter might develop into an actual fee-paying fee uh, mandate. So it's a good way of, of giving some value and getting something back uh, at some point in the, in the future. Secondments, uh, again, Imoni touched on that. Uh, very important now to help build a relationship, to help train your staff and the clients in-house at your firm or, or at the clients. And you know, we, we've done quite a lot of these secondments where we host uh, lawyers or clients uh, from abroad and we send people out uh, to do the same. It could be as little as a month or six months or in some cases a year. And it's a great way of building a, a long-term relationship. Uh, the next is training and know-how. We all do it, but really the question is, is how relevant is it? Clients don't want seminars. Uh, they get bombarded by newsletters and seminar invitations all the time. Uh, and if you're anything like me, no, most of them end up in the delete uh, folder. 
because they're not relevant. So, so keep it relevant. Offer bespoke training. Take the time to, to think about it before you say, well, here's an update, or I'd like to come and do a seminar. It, if it's relevant, generally it's well received. Um, the other thing is cross-referral opportunities and matchmaking. We all have huge Rolodexes of, of contacts these days in, in any number of countries. If you know a client is looking for a, an acquisition or wants to sell some of its business or simply wants to meet a potential joint venture partner in another country, think about it. Think about who you could introduce them to because it's, it, it shows your commercial acumen. It shows that you're thinking about them. It may not lead to immediate work, but I can, I can guarantee if it does result in a deal, you will get instructed. Uh, and we've seen it all, all, all the time. Investment in the country of focus. So we often get asked by clients is, well, you're working in Kenya or in Nigeria or in Egypt. W what are you doing besides just working with local lawyers and local clients? Uh, what, what, what else do you do? What do you invest in? Uh, and demonstrating that you invest in training, in seminars, in sponsoring events, in, in, in prizes for law students, and, and any number of things, in, in sponsoring art exhibitions. It could be anything like that, but it's the, it's the softer side of your business which uh, clients are, are generally Im Im impressed by. Uh, last two points is uh, diversity and inclusion. Increasingly in, in our pitches, clients want to know what is our policy on having uh, women in senior positions? What is our female development career progression like? What is our uh, disability uh, policy and so on? And it's, it's very important to demonstrate that you uh, can match their expectations as well. The last is uh, CSR. Uh, again, very important for clients now. They want to know about your pro bono policies. Are they for real or simply you just say, well, we do pro bono. Well, what do you do? How do you help pro bono? How do you help your community? How do you help the environment? Do you source paper from sustainable sources? How do you recycle? All of these things are small, but actually they all add up. And they all add up into a story about your law firm. And, and it, that's what makes you different to a client, uh, in my view. Uh, I think I've run my time. Thank you very much, Kamal. I think Kamal actually covered the field extensively. But you know, there are certain things you said that struck me. And I think um, I found very interesting, and um, I hope we can find time to go back to them. You know, the diversity and inclusion one, I, 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 I think it's interesting. Um, I didn't know clients have started paying that much attention to it. So it's, it's something we need to pay attention to. Um, when you go on your beauty parades, staff properly. Um, the value adds also, um, I, I know when do we draw the line? You know, when is it that we're giving free advice? And when does the clock start ticking? You know, there's all of that. And then, you know, the pitching area. I know a lot of us sometimes think our younger ones don't have the capacity to make the pitch for us. But we, 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 we have known firms that have won pitches where the partners are in the room, but it's the younger associates that's pitching. And that's kind of shown the client that there's depth in the firm. The partners chipped in. But many of us sometimes are worried about asking our younger ones. And so I, I think it's a point you've made that's a very valid point. People want to know the depth of your bench and the depth of your team. You know, and it's really key. Um, and on that note, I'll ask you, um, Sadiq, what, what do you guys want? You know, there are plenty of us in this room. All of us, we want to be lawyers to ExxonMobil. So how do we become lawyers to ExxonMobil and kind of push away the four or five other guys that you use? You know? Um, you ask a very uh, loaded question, but again, it's a question that is very simple. What we do when we consider a law firm for engagement with us, uh, we have two strata of ideas that we consider. Significantly, what are the door openers? What are the things we consider when we want to open our door to a law firm? And then secondly, what are the things we consider to nurture the relationship and make it permanent? These are the two areas where we, we focus our attention on. Regarding the door openers, the practice of law has changed significantly. It's no longer the times when 
a lawyer must win an argument. It's now more of a lawyer must collaborate with me and provide me enablers that work for my business. And I am looking for a lawyer who would sit down with me and say, what's your target? And then we work that together and reach that objective. Therefore, for me, if I have a law firm approach me and say, I want to be an outside counsel for Exxon Mobil, what are the first things that I consider? First of all, the resume of the firm. What kind of material as well as human resources do you have? Do you have lawyers that are significantly experienced in my industry issues? I need that focus. So if I visit with you and I have the firm demonstrate to me significant understanding of the oil industry, for example, and then I have practice areas with significant resources that would give me exactly the thing that I'm looking for, then you are the guy that has reached, I mean, has met my requirement for opening my door to you. I will visit with you. I will look at the kind of library that you have. I would interview with the individuals, individual lawyers that are in your firm. And if you are a small firm, and therefore you have a few number of people, all I need to do is to identify what kind of niche you've grown for yourself. Law practice is a practice that has a huge vista. And I was talking to somebody uh, a few minutes ago, and I was telling him, I said, you have to learn to approach law practice like a, a wise man driving a car at night. Your headlights can only go so far. But if you remain within that focus of your headlight, your car will lead you to your destination. You can't be a jack of all trade and master of none. You need focus. So if I came to you and you said to me, I am just interested in petroleum tax. And I look into your resources and I find out that you have researchers who, if I ask questions about petroleum tax, answers are coming very quickly. And you develop that leech. Anytime I need a person like that, you'll be my go-to guy. If you are in hydrocarbon development, the issue of regulation, and I come to you and I see resources, both material as well as uh, human, that are focused on that area of practice, and I have an issue in that field, you are the go-to guy. Therefore, like I said initially, my door openers are simply the resume of the firm. How many lawyers do you have? What's their area of expertise? What are your focus er practice areas? And when I see these things, my door opens, and then you walk in. What are the things that I consider that make me return you and cultivate that relationship so that we have a long-standing relationship. The first thing that I look for is Pak Tasun Savanda. You all of, all of you are familiar with it. The sanctity of my agreement with you. How are you a firm that keeps to the term of my engagement with you? Normally, my engagements are always written. Therefore, you know where I stand. There are issues that are very peculiar to me. For instance, the issue of ethics, that's fundamental to me. And you see copious references to what I need from you in terms of ethics. I'm going to watch out to see how much you keep to those. How much do you keep to the terms of your billing? What is the quality of your work to me? How responsive are you to my needs? Because you are providing me service. If I wake up in the morning and I see the union picketing my gate and I pick my phone, are you available to me? I pick my phone and I call you and I, what I see is responsiveness. Then that makes you the guy for the long haul. I am in the UK attending to some businesses and something happens and all I need to do is pick my phone and call you. And before you know it, you are there. And again, like I said, the quality of your response to me matters. I am not the kind of guy that is hung up on fees that you charge me. So long as what you charge me gives me value, and the value is commensurate to your bill, I'm willing to pay. 
But what we are discussing here is not my willingness or my ability to pay. But significantly what is on focus is your ability to provide me service. Therefore, if you are, being, if you are responsive, you keep to the terms of our agreement, and uh, I see you as the go-to guy all the time, then you are really my guy for the long haul. Uh, somebody talked about the issue of uh, uh, diversity and inclusiveness. One of the things that we are very, uh, we are very focused on is interpersonal relationship. I don't like a lawyer who would be there insulting my people. I want a lawyer who would have this personal relationship, the kind of person that you want your daughter to marry. <laughs> Believe me, the kind of person that has all the good qualities he is polite. He treats women with dignity. The kind of guy that has the skill sets that makes him blend in and work with people of diverse backgrounds. Nigeria is a, a potpourri of cultures and values. I don't want somebody who is hung up on I have to deal with an Igbo person or a Hausa person or a Yoruba person. I want someone who is issue focused and has the confidence to deal with everybody as a client, irrespective of where he comes from, irrespective of his gender, irrespective of his political affiliations. Those are the things that I want. But significantly, I need you to focus on your work product. You have good interpersonal skills, but let your work product speak for you. And also, an earlier speaker had spoken about the issue of alliances. If I come to you, and in getting to know you, I know that you have the strength of confidence to have alliances with firms, and I'm using the word alliances loosely, law firms overseas that have developed reputation in particular practice areas. You're actually inviting me to look at you very closely because I see that open-mindedness of somebody who is willing to embrace new things and new ways of doing things. Practice of law has gone away from the days of the 60s. When you sit down and hold on to yourself, sometimes I ask you, what are you afraid of? Reach out. Learn new things. Finally, I need to also uh, talk about the issue of me being, I mean, if I am your client, you have to learn to be a lawyer's lawyer. Internally, I have a huge law, law uh, department. Most of the things that come to you has already been debated internally, synthesized, and opinions have been expressed. And we come to the conclusion that this is the thing that we need an outside counsel to help us with. So when I come to you, I'm not coming to you like uh, the client from the street. I'm coming to you like a person who has a firm, an internal firm, but needs a superior or rather a, 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 a practice area that can deliver to me superior value. Or it could be that I'm out to engage you because I have challenges of time, not challenges of resources. So I'm coming to you to seek you to be a lawyer's lawyer. Therefore, your attitude to my people that engage you have to focus on that. Debate issues, be intellect. I mean, you can't afford to be intellectually lazy if you're a lawyer. You have to be engaging. And whatever product you bring to me should be able to advertise you. Your product should be your biggest advertisement. The use of precedent. You articulate an idea and you support it with a precedent that is so attractive. I'm not even hung up on, for those who go to court for me, I'm not really fixated on the fact that you must give me a successful outcome. But if I don't have a successful outcome, I need to have justifications that said to me, this man gave me his all. At the moment I have that, I am satisfied. And like I said initially, I'm not too hung up on cost. Not that I have unlimited resources, but I'm willing to pay for good quality work. Uh, gentlemen, other people have spoken on this issue, and uh, if we have time, you know, lawyers, talking is our stock in trade. We can speak to infinity. 
but I think I, I would stop here for. Thank you very much, Sadiq. I think Sadiq has said it very eloquently and very clearly. Um, you need to sell yourself. Your resume needs to speak for itself. But there's something you've said that strikes me, you know, we need to be people that can marry your daughter. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll keep that at the back of my mind. But the, <laughs> but the key thing, really, honestly, is that the quality of the work we deliver, our response time, ability to understand our client's business and to be part of our client's business. And he uses the phrase, the lawyer's lawyer. So that means you're not just a lawyer, you're the lawyer's lawyer. So I think it's plenty food for thought because we've gone away from when all you had to do or had to be was a great lawyer. That's just a tiny part of the equation. You know, in addition to being a great lawyer, you have to be so many other things. And he also said something else. And sometimes, you know, it's a debate I have with my litigators in my office. You know, you don't always have to argue to want to win the argument. What you need to do, particularly if you're working for a commercial, is to ensure that you deliver the deal within the confines of the law. That's your work. You know, um, it doesn't really matter whether that guy is arguing on all kinds of technicalities. That's not what your client wants. Your client wants an answer. And you can see that clearly from what Sadiq said. And also, even in court, you know, I've noticed some of my brothers argue little points to death, you know, and we spend forever in court on those little points that we argue to death. Is, does that work for our client? Is that what our client wants? Is that in the best interest of our client? So we need to start thinking as to how we practice. And at this point, I'll, I'll move to Tino Ade. Tino Ade has been in practice. Um, she's now a, a self-regulating entity and she's a client. So from your perspective and from your experience, you know, and from what everybody else has said, you know, what do you guys want from your lawyers? You know? Thank you very much. So one of the disadvantages of speaking last is that everyone has said what you would like to say. <laughs> but I'll try. So um, I think the very first thing that we want from our lawyers is to know us. Um, and I think as a self-regulatory organization, um, that is one of the issues that I find the most difficulty with in dealing with external counsel, that they don't really understand um, what the exchange is about and what the exchange is doing. And sometimes the difference between the exchange as a self-regulatory organization and other regulators, such as the statutory regulators. So I think um, spending more time to understand your client, spending more time to understand what your client is doing, what is important to your client, particularly at the, in the time that you're speaking to them. Using the exchange as an example again, this is a very interesting time for the exchange. Um, as you know, the competitive landscape for the exchange has changed. Um, there are a number of other exchanges. Um, we're not a government regulator. A lot of things have happened at the exchange in the last couple of years, um, starting with an intervention by the government regulator. So we want a lawyer who understands and can situate the exchange properly within that context. Do you know me or am I just an account to you? And when am I... If, um, um, to use Alaji's example, if I was going to use external counsel, one of the things that is very important to me in engaging external counsel is do they know me? Because if you don't know me, I don't think you can represent me appropriately in places where I am not um, able to represent myself or if I'm not there. The other thing is, are you listening to me? And are you listening to me is very, very important. Um, it's very, very important because there are certain ways in which I would like to have things done. And those, thing, those ways have been debated, to go back to the example of being a lawyer's lawyer. Uh, and in certain organizations such as mine, they've been debated beyond the legal team. Um, because legal services, contrary I think to what a lot of people think, Legal services are becoming um, like other services. So in many organizations, 
um, lawyers are no longer allowed to say, oh, there's something special about legal services, and therefore it's only lawyers that can speak to legal services. Other um, professionals within the organization keep challenging you to say why. So using my organization as an example, often this, anything that we bring to external counsel has been the subject of um, debate, has been the subject of reasoned argument. And what we want you to do is to assist us to achieve our aim. And it's a very fine balance that we're asking you to walk, of course, because we need you. Um, and that's why we've asked for you to come. Um, and that's why we've asked for your services. But at the same time, we want to understand that before you start proffering solutions, you have heard what we're saying, and it's not just an aside to you. Often the way we would want to be treated is documented in an engagement. And um, there may be parts of that engagement that you think are beneath you, or that you think are ridiculous, or that you think are petty, or that you just think, why do they need this? But there might be a policy within the organization that requires that type of feedback from you or that type of requirement in, in the context of your engagement letter. So please read the engagement letter appropriately. Be sure that you are fine with the terms of the engagement. And more importantly, be sure that you can keep to those terms, whether it be something like, I need a report within 48 or 24 hours of every court appearance. I need a report. I want it by WhatsApp. I want it by email. I just want a report. Because there might be an internal policy um, that propels all service providers, not necessarily lawyers alone, um, to do that, and it's important that you don't um, get me in, a, in a, a, a funny situation with the other um, people in the organization that I work with. Um, I also want a lawyer that is ready to provide high quality advice, and I think um, this one is a, a bitten horse, um, but it's very, very important. I want to know that I am getting good advice. And that advice where the law is not clear, I want to be clearly told what is unclear about the law and clearly what my options are. Not in an academic way, it's in a commercially sensitive, which is why you need to know me so that you will know what is commercially sensitive to me. Um, it's in a commercially sensitive and concise manner. Sometimes external counsel write tons, forgetting that um, that's not the only issue that um, the, the folks internally, not necessarily only the internal legal team. Um, also, I think on that point, knowing who the audience of your um, work product is. So if your work product is not only the legal team, I think asking, who, is, who else is going to see this work product? Is it going to your exco? Is it going to your CEO? Is it going to your board? Might help because you might then decide, I'm going to write an executive summary in addition to the longer uh, piece of work um, that, I'm, that I'm writing. Um, the other thing that I think it's important is to add value. And I think as a regulator, this one is very, very important to me. Um, adding value to me would be to tell me where I went wrong. Because the worst thing that can happen to a regulator is to go publicly wrong. And everybody knows that the regulator is publicly wrong. So what you find is many regulators do not like being publicly corrected. You as external counsel are in a very unique position because you've seen us what's and all to tell us where we went wrong. And to say it not only for the specific issue that you are handling, but also as a general thing. So a lawyer who's, where there is, for example, one of my rules that is problematic and I've been taken to court about it. A lawyer that says, well, if you put X, Y, and Z in all your bulletins going forward, you may avoid this situation. If you, um, write, if you write to all your regulated entities and say um, A, B, and C, 
you may avoid this issue going forward. That's a value add to me. What I find that many external counsel do now is, which is very good, they pick up um, areas of the law that they think are important and they write and distribute to all their clients. I like that. But value add that is specific to the client that you are dealing with, that is not um, simply, oh, this is, there's this issue in Nigeria and therefore we're going to write about it. Um, often there are, there are a number of other external counsels who are writing about the same thing. And often, if you are sound, the, 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 the content of the writing, the way it's written may be different, but the advice is the same. So five, four or five um, issues on a, a topical matter, four or five counsel writing on a topical mat matter is not as important as me as that nugget that you give me at the end of each engagement you have with me, which I may not necessarily have paid for, but I remember you and I think you're thinking about me and I'm special to you. I think relationships with the in-house team, very, very important. Um, sometimes you have external counsel who have multiple relationships within an organization and that's a good thing, having multiple relationships. But understanding that your client is the organization and that your um, primary point of contact is the in-house team. So the in-house team doesn't necessarily want to be hearing your opinion from the CEO, for example, because you're putting the in-house team in a very, um, what could be a very dicey position. And sometimes you're doing it just because you have access to the CEO or you have access to other members, uh, um, the board or whoever, which is all well and good and we encourage that, but realizing that you, have, you should circle back and keep those relationships with your primary contact, I think is very, very important because of um, you know, the fact that it will get back uh, to, to you if that is not done. I think that I will stop for now because many of the other points have already been um, taken on by my colleagues. Thank you very much, Inu. <laughs> my mind is here tell me we don't have very much time, but I think we need to have some audience participation here. And I wish we had a lot more time because I still have plenty of questions and I know you have um, for our panelists. But to summarize, you know, basically, you know, we need to be able to solve our clients' problems. We need to know our clients' business. The quality of the work we produce and our knowledge of the law must be first class and we take that for granted. But we have to take it for granted, so we need to train our guys. Our guys need to be good. We need to staff transactions properly. We need to communicate properly with our clients and communicate well and on time. We need to add value to their business. Now there's this issue of diversi diversity and um, inclusion. And I find that really interesting. Now I know, you know. Um, I, I thought it was the other way around, but now I know. Um, we need to be consistent in meeting our clients' expectations. And then um, Sadiq talks about sanctity of agreements, and I know clients are, are very, very particular about that. If you sign your EL, your client wants you to stick with your EL. And if something is going to change, please tell them on time and tell them quickly and tell them why. You know, that's important. Then they need to trust you. You know, all of our four speakers said, you know, the issue of trust, the issue of transparency, the issue of ethics, you know, maybe some lawyers think that all you need to do is do it. But how you do it, you need to do it, but how you do it is as important as doing it, you know. So that's also really important. We need to get the deal done. So we don't want you arguing and fighting over little points and trying to score cheap points, you know, and trying to show who is the better lawyer. That's immaterial to the client's deal. What the client wants is to get his deal done within the ambits of the law quickly, efficiently, and he's secured and they're safe. You know, I don't really care if you are the better debater. You know, so we need to understand all these things. So there's so many things that we need to pay attention to and, and the ground is shifting. You know, how good are we on technology? How good are we in being, you know, totally foresighted? What's our vision level? You know, and are we businesses? Um, somebody said yesterday that are we looking at law as the business of law? not as just being lawyers, you know? So things are changing and we need to be dynamic. And at this point, I'll pause to ask if there are any questions. Ah, okay. Um, where are the roving mics? Let's start from the extreme right. There's a lady, or my extreme right, there's a lady, pink sleeves. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, good morning. My name is Ade Kumbi Ogunde. 
And my question Please, uh, can you speak rather clearly? We, are, we have a bit of a disadvantage here, and we haven't rectified that on this side. So if you're not speaking clearly, we won't hear you properly. Okay. Yeah, my name is Adekumbi Ogunde, and my question is really about managing client expectations. Because sometimes what you get is that clients do take lawyers for granted and you get clients who are quite difficult and you know they set unreasonable deadlines for, for, for lawyers to meet because if you do not take it, somebody else, another lawyer is going to take it so they throw whatever you know they want to, to the client, to the lawyers. And really, and you know, it's almost, it's almost really like, uh, well, I don't want to liken it to a husband and wife relationship where the wife is constantly trying to please the husband to say, oh, how do you want your bed laid? Do you want it laid on Monday and Tuesday and not on Wednesday? That's what, that's what lawyers are really doing. Do you want monthly reports or no, no, no. Do you want me to send it to you whilst you're, I don't know, on a boat cruise or something? And really, when, when do you, where do you draw the line and how? Do you, do you draw the line and when do you draw the line to just really say, you know what, take it somewhere else. I don't think I can really meet this. I think what she was talking about, she's talking about very difficult clients, unreasonable clients, and where you draw the line and say, you know, take your work somewhere else, you know. Um, okay, the gentleman on the second row. Bumi, I'm going to dock you, you know, you have undue advantage. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. My name is Adiremi Oguntoye. You know what, sir? Yes, yeah. sir. Can you just quickly come out and come up here? You know, it may wow. be better for all of us. Okay. Because you're speaking with your bedroom voice, and that's difficult. So <laughs> try, try, try and just step out here. And, and... Okay. Can you hear me now? It's better. Thank you. Just, you, can, okay. you can have, do a three-quarter okay. degree. Yeah, okay. Thank you. My name is Adiremi Oguntoye. I run a law firm. I want to find out from the panelist. To what extent a objectivity a factor in doling out briefs to lawyers, external counsel. And I'm asking this a very thank you. We operate in a very peculiar society. I got a brief from a consulting organization in the UK, and the brief kept coming for 10 years. And someday, one of the directors said to me that, how come the consulting organization in Nigeria is not engaging your firm? And I was very blunt. I said, because I do not know, I don't have any personal relationship with the guys who are heading the consulting organization in Nigeria. So, we know the truth. To a great extent, it appears man no man gets you brief. I'm not disagreeing with what you have said. It's good to have capacity, competence, you know, God cost. But to what extent? There is a particular organization that I have been marketing for three years. But I know that Aswe Godalo is the lead counsel that renders services for them, but the immediate, the deputy general counsel is my own friend, so I'm praying that the general counsel will leave, who is Aswe's friend. Thank you very much. So he's asking about subjectivity as a factor to giving briefs. I'll dock the other part, you know. Uh, let's take one more question, then I will go back to the panelists, you know. Um, can we, is there anybody at the back? Okay, if there's nobody at the back, the gentleman on the second row here, please. Can you please just step out, if you don't mind? It helps all of us. Is that mic working? It, I yeah, think so, thank, you. thank you. My name is Chibwe Zengozi. That guy was setting me a landmine. <laughs> okay, my name is Chibwe Zengozi. And Sorry, can we have a microphone that works well, please, so that we can enjoy this? Uh... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So my question really uh, touches on independence and impartiality of the lawyer, especially uh, for in-house counsel. 
So if um, for in-house counsel, our clients are the business. And most times clients actually want us to be part of their business, you know, get involved, you know, to, to you know, know the business and the lines, you know, become blurred at some point, whether we are actually lawyers in that context or business people. And you find that the clients actually put a premium on the lawyers who, you know, at some point shift from the attorney uh, position and then become almost like a part of the business. So my question is really, um, because all I've heard from all, everybody on the panel today is that relationship is very key to winning client trust and client um, um, work. So at what point do we draw the line that you know, we will remain independent and impartial you know, in order to give you know, quality legal service to clients? Thank you. Okay, relationships and subjectivity, impartiality, at what point do we draw the line? Um, okay, can we, let me start with Tinu, then I'll go to Sadiq, then I'll do Imoni, then I'll do um, Shal. So let's, Okay, thank you. So I'll start with the last question first. How do you, uh, how do you deal with concerns about blurring the line between being a business person and an attorney? I think you always have to keep your professional ethics in view. Um, and I think that you have to be careful, just like in-house counsel have to be careful to ensure that they're always providing legal advice. But the, the point we're making is that your legal advice cannot just stop at being legal advice. It has to be commercially reasonable for your client. And it's something that I think as you keep doing it, you get better with it. That's what I've observed, just, that, just looking at some of the more senior lawyers that we have relationships with who I believe are very good at that. So it's a question of, I think, sometimes giving the legal advice and then saying, for your own business, X, Y, and Z, this is probably the way you want to do it. Or how, you know, getting more into their mind to see what it is that they want to do. But you can't stop at the legal advice. I don't know whether I'm making any sense to you. You're not shaking your head. Uh, <laughs> you're not shaking your head uh, vertically. So maybe I'm not, and maybe somebody else will have uh, better luck uh, making sense with that one, given that there's limited time. Subjectivity and man, no man. I think it depends on the organization. Um, as I alluded to, I think in many organizations, legal services are being procured very much like other services. And so, um, at least with respect to litigation, by way of RFPs, and by way of, um, you know, you look at the roster that you have of lawyers, so getting onto that roster is important. They've done a visit to you to make sure that um, your office actually exists and, and what have you, some of the things that Alaji spoke about when he was speaking. And then, um, once you get onto that roster, RFPs are sent based on that roster and for litigation looking at what it is that you bring that you submit and reviewing what you submit and then um, trying to figure out whose submission the in-house team figuring out whose submission they feel is the best. So I think litigation, it's very difficult with litigation to do man no man, at least on a regular basis, if you have an RFP um, requirement under the, under the legal policy of the client that you're dealing with. So you might want to check whether the clients that you're interested in actually have legal policies or litigation policies that require them to follow certain processes. I think with, tra with advisory work, it's a bit more tenuous. And if you have a policy, again, and I keep on talking about working with clients who have policies and procedures, you will find that the um, in-house team at some point will have to justify why certain litigations or why certain opinions or requests for transactional work are going to the same clients. If you're working with a client who um, actually is run by policies and procedures, which I think if you are concerned about the man no mind, you want to um, target clients like that because you, are better, you have a better um, um, uh, opportunity of actually getting the work because they're policy and procedural based. With respect to managing clients' expectations, 
again i have to go back to the fact that legal services are not are no longer re regarded as special I, I, we need to we need to get over the fact that there's anything special about about legal services they're being treated in more and more organizations just like any other type of service and the accountants the auditors will do all those things that you're saying that um, lawyers are finding difficult to do and so lawyers are being held to the same standards as the big four accounting firms in many organizations and the big four accounting firms will turn around things. And so when you look at the business of law, I think that um, looking at the example of the big four accounting firms and seeing how they run their practices is one place where lawyers can, can um, begin to see how they can model to ensure that they can provide um, this type of um, service that you're, that you're concerned about. But I'm sorry to tell you that I don't think it's going to change. I think especially with globalization, which is upon us, the panel before spoke about it, those requirements, those demands for um, quick responses, timely responses, responses from the most senior people or the people that are really supposed to be working on the engagement are going to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. And general counsel are always under so much pressure. You know, chief executives are under so much pressure. You know, so that's really not going to change. You just have to learn to deal with it. Imoni, quickly. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, like I mentioned initially, we have a, a large practice group internally that normally reviews issues and opine on them before we go to outside council. Uh, what I lead from outside council is normally a power of superior argument. In spite of all the, the reviews and everything in-house, I need to go to an outside council that gives me superior argument. And I keep telling my, my lawyers internally, I remember this quote from Lord Denning. He said, uh, true seekers of knowledge expect their ideas and their faith in those ideas to be continually tested. And that's like a mantra for me. If you give me superior argument, I'm willing to embrace it. So to answer the young man's question, my man, no man, as far as I'm concerned, is superior argument. If I deal with you and your reasoning is always superior, you are going to be my man, no man. I'll always go to you. Therefore, therefore when I give you a job, I'm giving you an, in, an opportunity to introduce yourself to me. I'm giving you an opportunity to advertise the service that you provide for me. So if you came to me with work product that is superlative in quality believe me you are going to be my man no man i will go back to you all the time and like we said you know uh, uh general council senior uh, council within within uh, organizations are inundated by requests for um for engagement uh, we have law firms many of them everybody come in so we have to go through which of them can we go with so if you are ever given the opportunity to come in don't shut the door uh, behind you. Come in and say to yourself, I am here to stay. And the only way you can advertise your stay in power is the superiority of your argument, the superiority of the quality of the service that you provide. And like I said to you initially, I'm not too hung up on how much it costs me to get that. What I need is a legal advice that enables me to do my that, work. You know. Yeah. We're all happy to hear that you are, <laughs> you are, you are, price, you are price elastic, you know. Thank you. Thank you. The thank you very much. Yeah. You're done. Okay, thank you. Come out. Yeah. So, um, the only thing I, would... I thought I was going to come out first and I was taking you last. Okay, fine. I wanted to change. I had my reasons for wanting to change. No, no, please go on. The, the only thing I would add is it comes back to your strategy, almost for all three questions, right? So we've talked a lot about what we want, what we want, what we want. But when you are going out to get clients, you have to have a strategy. First of all, the strategy needs to be adaptable, right? So it's not that I set my strategy last year and I'm never going to change it. You understand the external operating context and then you know what kind of clients you want. A client who comes to, to you with an RFP with a stupid deadline or expectations of costs, and when you try the superior argument, does not buy it, may not be a client you want. The actual risks of taking on that client may be higher 
than the risk of losing the business. A client who gives you a, a very clear sort of engagement terms, but is always wanting to be involved, is micromanaging, not letting you do anything, may not be the kind of client. So the ability to also say either this client doesn't fit my strategy for cost or whatever is a very, very strong one. You may make a decision that I really want to be in this sector. I'm just going to throw bodies at it. The deadline is impossible. I want to do it. But again, that is part of your strategy of being in that sector. Thank you very much. You know, that's, that's really telling, you know. We all need to determine our own strategy and our focus, you know. And the days of jack of all trades, master of nothing, those days are gone. Come on. Thanks. I think the lady over there asked, you asked about difficult clients and how to deal with them and manage them, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, we all have difficult clients uh, from time to time. I think the, the main thing is to be firm, to be fair, to be ethical and try your best. Not all relationships work out. Uh, and at some point, you're going to have to draw a line uh, that uh, you may part ways. But if you part ways for the right reason, uh, they may come back. Uh, and, and so uh, that's certainly my experience. For, on the gentleman's question about subjectivity and personal relationships and, and, and the fact that you've been marketing to, to someone and it, and it still goes to the same firm, um, it, it happens everywhere. Uh, In-house counsel may have been at private law firms before. They know how they think and operate their strengths and their weaknesses, so they may be giving that firm the work knowing them but that doesn't mean you you can't keep trying because at some point that firm may be conflicted they may have an issue they may slip up they may the general counsel may need another firm so if you in their mind the chances are you will get something at some point but it's partly perseverance and, and focused uh, marketing thank you very much we don't have any more time um i hear um we there's a, another session that's um going to come up soon. Um, but I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank you for your participation. I know this is a topic that's close to all your hearts, and um, we could have talked about it a bit more. Uh, I know there are a few more people that wanted to ask questions. But um, our panelists are still here for a few minutes, so you can ask them what you want to ask them. But I'd like you all to join me in thanking them. Um, it's clear that... Um, It's clear that um, the ground is shifting. Our clients want us to be totally responsive. They take it for granted that we know the law, but they want us to be responsive. They want us to understand and know their business. Uh, they want us to be ethical, honest, transparent people, people that stick by the contracts we sign to. Um, and they need us to be super men and women, actually. That's what they need, you know? So I think we should all learn to be supermen and women. We all need to understand and give our clients what they want. I think the important thing is for us to have first-class law firms in this jurisdiction. We're building many. We need many more. People keep talking about 180 million people. We're not lawyered enough. Um, there's still a lot of business out there. There's still a lot of special niche areas out there, and we all need to look for them. I'd like to thank you very much. I'd want you to please again thank Tinu, Imoni, Kamal, and Sadiq. They've done a wonderful job. And I join you in thanking them. Thank you very much. And have a good afternoon.